Thanks everybody and, and thank you Tim. Uh, just, just to give it a bit more context, so I'm one of the uh, uh, three components of Avacan. There's training and service development, which is Rosary and Tim. There's a data bureau that uh, is coordinated nationally through a company called Strategic Data. And then uh, I lead the analysis and reporting functions of Anacan and have done so for the last 15 years. So a large part of our work, our prime part of our work is to analyse and report the National Outcomes and Case Mix Collection. We also have responsibility for information development in the context of new and emerging priorities and I'll spend a bit of time today talking about that as well. So just, just a bit of an overview, um, some context by way of the uh, National Outcomes and Case Mix Collection Strategic Directions work. This was work that was done well, five years ago, led to five, 25 recommendations. I'll talk you through those in terms of where we thought in 2014 we'd be heading over the next 10 years. And then introduce to you also some uh, uh, things that have happened along the way, like the Fifth National Mental Health Plan, like new HONOS glossaries, to, to share with you also some thinking about our work in terms of um, uh, making more relevant and useful the uh, products of the National Outcomes and Case Mix Collection and how we're enhancing the reporting. And then finally spend a bit of time talking about some dilemmas, challenges and trying to make sense of what's going to happen over the next little while. I'm not sure I can do all of that but I'll give it a go. So just, this is really just by way of context. Back in 20, uh, 2010, 2011, the overarching committee for AMICAN, the Mental Health Information Strategy Standing Committee, thought it was a good time, 10 years down the track, to do a stock take of where we've got to with outcome measurement in Australia, having spent to that time 10, 15 years getting there, thinking ahead for the next 10 years. And that work, uh, you could download the report from our website, um, importantly had uh, some 25 recommendations. Now, I'm not going to walk you through every single one of these, but rather want to make a, a couple of um, observations as we go. 25 ideas emerged back in 2014, led to, if you like, a work program for, uh, for the Australian Mental Health Outcomes and Classification Network. And what I've done here is put some um, traffic headlights in terms of status for each of the 25 recommendations. You don't need to really look at those in any detail other than notice that the colours change from green to yellow to red, reflecting various uh, uh, levels of progress against that. Some things have been started, some things are stalled, some things no longer become, um, become relevant. But out of all of that, <coughs> there are a number of key project areas that um, uh, are quite pointy at the moment and demanding a lot of our time. And there are just really four things here I want to quickly signpost. Noting that none of these things are really envisaged in the uh, NOC strategic directions work. We've spent a large investment of our time over the last six months thinking about the new HONOS glossaries and apologies to Mark, Tim and Peter who have spent the morning telling you about the existing HONOS glossaries. We now have available new HONOS glossaries and I'll talk you through some of the issues associated with that. Over the last 12-18 months we've also been investing in a, uh, a review of the evidence around what we know about the HONOS measures. So the HONOS has been around now for some 20 odd years, 25 years. There is a lot of accumulated material about that in terms of its reliability, its validity and the like. Separately, uh, 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 my colleagues Meredith and um, uh, in particular are looking at the effect of consumer-rated measures on outcomes. 
So does the consumer reporting their outcomes, their status, actually make a difference? And the fourth area of work that, um, that's involving Tim and Cheryl as well is looking at developing a new consumer rated measure. I'm just really signposting those rather than spending a lot of time on them. Noting too that uh, back in 2012-13 when we're doing the North Strategic Directions work, we were mindful that you know the landscape keeps changing. We just really weren't quite sure in what ways it was evolving and changing. And in particular, over the last couple of years, primary mental health care networks have become a prominent part of the mental health landscape. There is a much greater focus now on regional planning. We have the National Disability Insurance Scheme. We have the Australian Mental Health Care Classification and the, the, uh, the associated requirements around that in terms of phase of care, which Graham will, uh, will talk to later on. <coughs> and of course, we have a fifth national mental health plan. So in other words, four or five years after not strategic directions, a lot of things are happening, continuing to happen, and not entirely clear what, they, uh, what they're all going to mean. Briefly to talk about the fourth and fifth national mental health plans. Initially, you know, there'd be a plan every five years. Between plan four and plan five, there was quite a hiatus. Um, plan five was released in August last year. And from five priority areas under the fourth plan, we have eight priority areas under the fifth plan. And even although there's some way of aligning the two, um, there's not perfect alignment. And as mentioned before, the, uh, the landscape of mental health services has changed, especially with, reflect, with respect to primary health care networks and, uh, and the like. So, the new hot house glossaries, and I say this with some trepidation. So, way back in, uh, I think, 2006-2007, uh, Tom Trower, who you may know, the late Tom Trower, who was one of the key proponents of the hot house in Victoria in the early 2000s, Along with Bill Buckingham, uh, who's been a major uh, player in the mental health information scene over the last 25 years, had a look at the existing HONOS, the HONOS as published in 1996. And with some then 10 years experience using the HONOS, it was quite clear that a number of scales were problematic. And in particular, scale 8, other problems, scale 11, living conditions and scale 12 um, employment opportunities. Those three scales anecdotally appeared to be very poorly completed um, uh, relative to the other scales. And that led to an international program of work which involved the United Kingdom through Mick James and John Painter. It involved New Zealand through Malcolm Stewart as well as uh, at Mark in reviewing the glossaries for the HONOS and separately for the HONOS 65 plus. And at the end of the day, this is a very simplified summary of what's gone on with the 12 scales for each of the two. Almost all scales had some kind of work done in terms of updating the glossaries, uh, ranging from, very, for, well, from no changes at all for the physical health scale on the HONOS, to minor word changes, to moderate, to even quite major changes. And you know, the major changes were obviously focused on scales 8, 11 and 12. This happens separately for the HONOS and separately for the HONOS 65 plus. The HONOS uh, glossaries, new ones were published I think earlier this year, and the HONOS 65 is about to be, uh, to be made public. Now, with all of that, it brings a number of interesting challenges. 
We know nothing about the brand new hot Oz glossaries as opposed to the 25 years of experience we had with the old uh, existing ones. And moreover, there's you know, no evidence to judge whether in fact the new glossaries achieve their goal of improving inter-rater reliability with respect to the measurement of the scales. So we were asked, Amacan was asked to to uh, investigate what would be required to build the evidence base for the new HONOS glossaries. And effectively, we started that work by looking what was already known about the old glossaries. Uh, and, you know, way back uh, in the very early days of Amacan, back in 2005, one of our first jobs was to look at the evidence with respect to the HONOS scales. And there were, you know, less than 100 published papers. Over the last, uh, in the interim, in, intervening 12 years, there's been hundreds of papers published on the HONOS scales. And the majority of that work comes from Australia, uh, about uh, Australia, New Zealand, the UK, about two thirds of all that work. Uh, a number of them are focused very specifically on the measurement properties, i.e. do they meet standards for reliability, do they meet standards for um, validity. And in terms of what we know, well, there is evidence from the published work that uh, the scales are not equal in terms of their, uh, their properties. Some are better than others, and as the international review team uh, initially thought that, uh, you know, problems with scale 12 on the HONOS in particular in terms of inter reliability. Overall, nonetheless, the existing HONOS scales, there's a significant body of evidence and it's modest to very good evidence across a range of different uh, dimensions. What I'll do very briefly now, just pause and say and note that the international review occurred independently of considering the published material on uh, the performance of the scales. And even although they identify in scales 8, 11 and 12 as being major problems, when we actually looked at the published work, it's really for the adult HODL, scale 12, that's a problem. So the magic number to look for in the column called estimate is a number of 0.7. If the number is 0.7, then in terms of inter-rated reliability, it's good. Only scale 12 fails that cut and dried 0.7 criterion. Uh, this is just for the HONOS. There's a, obviously a summary that we've been able to put together for the, uh, for the HONOS 65 plus. So just very briefly, we, we now have a dilemma that there is a brand new HONOS glossaries out there. And there's great nervousness around this. Uh, Mark in New Zealand and I have had several discussions around, well, what does this mean? And it means if countries chose to adopt the new glossaries, that training, infrastructure and the like, considerable resources are going to be required to refocus that. There is no commitment within Australia to move to the new glossaries. Rather, at this stage, we've been asked, what do we need to do to establish the evidence that the new glossaries are at least as good as the old glossaries? And that's a piece of work that we'll be developing over the next 12 months. That's all rather theoretical. Um, Let's talk about something quite substantial and, uh, and actual in terms of how we report the NOC data. And over the years, um, we've evolved our reporting from paper-based reports to versions of decision support tools to online versions of the WDST and the like. And you can access this information by simply going online to the Amagant website under how we report. So the WDST is something we initially developed some 10, 12 years ago. And 
We've had feedback over the years in terms of uh, how to improve and increase its utility and the like. And in particular, feedback we got was that uh, we like it, but we want more and we want something different. And in particular, we're interested in looking at different measures simultaneously. So at the moment you log on to the WDST and you query it, you can query the whole NOS alone. But uh, folks like you have been saying to us, we'd like to see the HONOS on the left-hand side and the consumer rate of measure like the K10 on the right-hand side. So we've in fact been doing that work and hope to release a new version of the WDST in the next uh, month or so that will enable you to have on the left-hand side of the screen one measure and on the right-hand side of the screen another measure. And this opens up some really exciting possibilities. If you think about um, the, the idea of different perspectives on outcomes, and at the outset, the National Outcomes and Case Mix Collection was about different perspectives. The clinician perspective as measured through the HONOS and the consumer perspective as captured with the K10, for example, or the SDQ for child and adolescents. And to show you what this will look like, so at the moment, just pretend, well, at the moment you get just one side of the screen, the left-hand side of the right-hand side. But here you can put the two bits of information together. So what I've done with the first one is I've put the SD, uh, the Honoska uh, total scores for child and adolescents at admission to uh, ambulatory care. And on the right hand side, you have the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, total score, total difficulties score for the shame uh, uh, collection occasion admission to ambulatory care for child and adolescents. And if you think through it a bit more, well, one of the great opportunities you have in terms of getting pers different perspectives is if you take the SDQ fantastic measure. The SDQ comes in various flavours. For consumers aged 11 to 17, there is a parent rated version and there is a youth rated version. And here you can look at uh, the profiles from how the parent might assess their consumer versus the youth doing the self rating. And typically, parents will rate uh, consumers' problems at a higher level than the uh, youth self-report rating. And what I think we think this does is it provides an opportunity to uh, promote engagement uh, with the consumers and with the carers around different perspectives on mental health status. And this is also available obviously for the adult measures. Here on the left hand side you can see the HOTOS total score. On the right hand side you can see the K10 total score. So how the clinician thinks the consumer is travelling and how the consumer sees themselves as travelling. And then drilling down even further. Uh, so scale 7 on the HOTOS is depressed mood. And on the right hand side, the total score on the K10. The K10 is, as you know, a very uh, generalised measure of non-specific distress. So you would expect to see uh, some convergence if folks were thinking about things in the same way. We're about to uh, release that uh, shortly. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about um, reporting. And this becomes relevant when we remember that not so long ago, back in March this year, the headlines in the paper were South Australia, the worst outcomes in the nation. Where were they getting that data? Well, they were getting it from the HOLOS. And the, the, uh, the data in particular they were looking at was the top panel, South Australia 
had the smallest proportion, the lowest proportion of significant improvement relative to other jurisdictions. I think it was 65, 66% versus 71%. And that became front page news. Terrific. This caused Mark and the Health Department enormous grief. Uh, Simon also scratching his head, thinking what's going on. It's uh, the motivation for, for doing these kind of things is not always clear. Noting, I think, that you had an election a few weeks later um, and sells stories. It's interesting that uh, the journalist chose not to look at the year 2013-14 where ACT, in fact, had the worst outcomes nationally at that time. But rather they looked at 2015-16 for South Australia. And, you know, a part of the angsting around this is um, what's going on. Why is it that South Australia looks as if it is the worst performing? And when we you know, scratched it a bit more at the surface, we see that South Australian total scores at admission to inpatient care are about 1.2 points higher than the national average, suggesting perhaps that South Australian consumers at inpatient care are more severe than their, their uh, fellow Australian counterparts. But then also at, uh, at follow-up, at discharge, the total score in South Australia on average for adult inpatient care was 9.2, for the rest of Australia 6.4. So there was about a two, three point difference between South Australia and the rest of the country. And this really provokes some, you know, angst and reflection as to what's going on. Are in fact the folks in South Australia more severe than those seen elsewhere, one hypothesis. It leads to if they are more severe, is there a way, a better way of trying to reflect that, um, that difference in our reporting of outcomes? And there is a whole uh, industry of case mix adjust adjusted outcome methodologies, which is, an if, if you like, an an effort to try and level the playing field and compare apples with apples, oranges with oranges. At the end of the day, um, for whatever reason, it really is important to note that the score at discharge remains quite high relative to the other jurisdictions. Now that too can lead to other speculations and musings. I think a part of the, uh, the conversation was uh, from some stakeholders in South Australia saying we discharge folks too early, they're too unwell to be discharged, but because of pressure on beds, blah. That was one story. But the numbers in themselves don't tell the full story. And I guess the risks always are that um, if you put this information out there, it may or may not get used in the kind of ways that you would hope it would get used. So I'm going to just close up and talk a bit about where to from here. And I mentioned at the outset, you know, we, we, we started off back in uh, uh, 2000 collecting routine outcome measures. Ten years after that, we did a stock take. We had to think about where we should be going next. We started to commit resources to heading in that next direction. And then along the way, we've had a few surprises, if you like. Uh, the Australian Mental Health Care Classification emerged uh, three, four years ago, introducing a brand new concept called phase of care. And phase of care and the Australian Mental Health Care Classification use the HONOS for um, for the purposes of classifying uh, the products of mental health care and also introduce a cost associated with each class. And this raises a real challenge for 
routine reporting on mental health outcomes via the HONOS. It is, on the one hand, if you're using it as an outcome measure, how can that be faithfully and independently measured and rated when it's also used in the context of funding services? This is a real concern. A real concern too is what to do with the new HONOS glossaries and it can't be underestimated that the resources that have already been expended in putting the existing glossaries on the ground to redo that is a significant investment. And then the dilemma is, well, we're not quite sure what they're going to be doing in the UK. We're not too sure what our folks across the ditch are going to do in New Zealand. Um, these are real anxieties. And I must stress that um, Australia has made no commitment to move to the new glossaries, but rather committed to finding out, does it in fact achieve what it was meant to achieve? And finally, uh, just noting that the requirements of the fifth plan continue to evolve with um, a change of priorities, um, in particular around PHNs and the like. And it, it's, it's timely, I think, to just reflect um, whether the priorities that we set under the NOC strategic directions back uh, five years ago remain relevant or require further fine-tuning in the light of um, those new requirements. So that's a, a very broad general overview covering um, what we currently report, what we're hoping to report and some of the unknowns around what are the risks to further reporting. Thanks Jim.